Today's case brings us to Oregon, more specifically, Roseburg, Oregon at the Umpqua Community College. It's here that a disturbed 26-year-old male college student, Christopher Harper, unleashed terror on the campus. His disturbed actions on an October day in 2015 would go on to haunt hundreds of people. Christopher Harper Mercer was born on July 26, 1989 in England to his father Ian Mercer and his mother Laurel Harper. Before Christopher was born, his parents separated and they agreed to share legal custody over him. However, the divorce wasn't finalized until 2006 and between 1989 and 2006 the pair simply lived apart. The shared custody aspect of the divorce never fully came to fruition and he spent the large majority of his time over at his mother's house. As a child, he and his mother moved to the Los Angeles area, eventually settling around Torrance, California in some apartments as Christopher got a bit older. His mother said throughout most of his life he was very quick to anger and his mood could switch in an instant if something irritated him. She also stated that Harper had Asperger's syndrome and that she also suffered from Asperger's. In various Yahoo answer threads under the username named Tweety Bird, Laurel stated that Chris was difficult to raise due to his outbursts of anger. While growing up, he would frequently have violent rage-induced fits and would have to be held in a bear hug until he got tired and his energy was fully depleted. If upset, he would bang his head into walls violently. This extended well beyond his childhood years. A former neighbor of Harper said that one day his bicycle tires got slashed. This would upset anybody, but he took this a step further, going into a full-blown tantrum, kicking and punching surrounding objects near the bike. His mother recalls other odd behaviors such as opening the car door while the car was moving at high speeds and later on urinating in buckets to avoid having to go to the bathroom. His mother wasn't the only one noticing odd behavior and even had some odd tendencies herself. Neighbors at the apartment complex mentioned that Christopher couldn't sit still. His neighbors underneath him were frequently annoyed by what sounded like rapid pacing well past midnight coming from above them. This lasted for hours. They also said that Laurel would often call Christopher baby, even well into his adult years. She would frequently keep an eye on him and was said to be very protective over him. Some of the neighbors said Laurel was nice and would say hello to the neighbors she saw while outside, while others stated she would often send written complaints to the building's management over noises, weed odors, and overall complained often and was negative. In Christopher's teenage years, he developed a keen interest in guns and a fascination with the military. Neighbors who lived around Christopher during these years said he would often be seen wearing the same combat boots and army attire for multiple days in a row while riding his red bicycle around the neighborhood. Neighbors went on to say that the pair mostly kept to themselves and spent the vast majority of their time in their dirty apartment. Before Harper turned 18, he was arrested after throwing an unidentified object at another person. The specifics of the incident aren't well known, and he was released shortly afterwards. In 2008, Harper joined the U.S. Army but was discharged after only five weeks due to not meeting minimum standards and basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Individuals close to the investigation state that he was discharged due to attempted suicide, although no confirmation of this was ever given by Army personnel. Harper returned home, depleted and angry from his failure. Shortly after returning, he got into a heated argument with his mother that culminated in him pointing a shotgun at her. In the documents, the direct result of this occurrence is blacked out. However, it does say he was released after 72 hours. In California, law enforcement officers and mental health professionals can place an individual on an emergency 72-hour hold if they are determined to pose a danger to themselves or others due to a mental health issue. While not proven, this is one of the more logical assumptions. Upon being released, Chris and his mother made up and started to bond over guns. Laurel, his mother, was initially anti-gun, but eventually Chris convinced her to try target shooting. She ended up enjoying the activity and they would frequently go to gun ranges to shoot together. Throughout these years, Mercer was described as a quiet, weird kid that was the target of bullying and wouldn't talk much unless guns were brought up. It seems that he graduated from the Switzer Learning Center in 2009 with four others. Switzer is described as a school for people with learning disabilities and emotional issues. Moving on into 2013, Laurel and Chris researched areas to move to. Their research eventually led them to Roseburg, Oregon, as they both agreed that it looked like a good area to live at. They moved to some apartments in Roseburg, Oregon that same year, and Laurel got a job as a nurse at the Douglas County Jail while Christopher started attending Umpqua Community College. During Chris Christopher's time at college, he was a terrible student. 
It's reported that he hovered around a 1.7 GPA and didn't show any initiative when it came to improving. He was placed on scholastic probation. His standing at the college was so bad that he was on the verge of being suspended if his grades didn't improve. Laurel and Christopher resumed shooting together, both enjoying the less restrictive gun laws in place in Oregon when compared to their previous home state, California. During his adult years, Chris Mercer never held down a job and paid for guns through selling his video games and getting money from his mother. At their new home in Oregon, Mercer would spend his time on the computer in his bedroom. He would frequently watch documentaries on school shootings, upload adult content on torrent sites, and try online dating with no success. He would also post on various forums and his blog online. In this blog, he shared some troubling thoughts. On an interesting note, I have noticed that so many people like him are all alone and unknown, yet when they spill a little blood, the whole world knows who they are. A man who was known by no one is now known by everyone. His face splashed across every screen, his name across the lips of every person on the planet, all in the course of one day. Seems the more people you kill, the more you're in the limelight. His mother stated that he made comments regarding shootings and would critique how they could have done better and that the shooters needed to step their game up. Presumably, a few days before the attack, Christopher started typing his six-page manifesto. His mother also stated that while Harper was quick to anger, he was not impulsive and she suspects he planned the attack days before, but not months or years before. This point is somewhat reflected in his chilling manifesto. This manifesto, while not nearly as long as Elliot Rogers, is still six pages of alarming thoughts. If he had planned the attack months in advance, it's likely the manifesto would have been longer and more detailed. Right at the beginning, he claims he is the most hated person in the world and has been under attack by morons and idiots throughout life. Much like Elliot Roger, he states his frustration over being a virgin with no job and nothing to live for. He blamed the world and society for denying him things he desired. Also found in the manifesto were Christopher's racist ideals toward black men specifically, likening them to wild animals. And while Christopher himself identified as 40% black, he says he was spared from the bad traits due to his black side coming from his mother. Near these points, his loathing of organized religion is also evident. The latter seems to line up with his various dating profiles. He went on in the manifesto to praise incels and school shooters as godly figures. He claimed that once he had carried out his plan, he would stand among Elliot Roger, Fester Flanagan, the Columbine shooters, Adam Lanza, and Sung Cho. He claimed his beliefs were more spiritual and aligned more with the occult. There was also talk of aligning with demonic forces and returning to the world after death as a demon in order to kill again and again. Toward the end of the manifesto, Christopher gave his critiques on mass shooters, stating that where they always go wrong is they don't work fast enough and the death toll isn't anywhere near where it should be. They shoot wildly instead of targeted blasts. They also don't take on the cops. Why kill other people but you won't take out the cops? The manifesto closes out with more praise to Elliot Roger, claiming that Elliot is a god. The last line of the manifesto is adorned with a pentagram and 666 on each side. It says, For Satan, I do this. For the darkness, I do this. Two days before the attack, Harper went to a pawn shop to sell one of his shotguns and purchase a handgun. The footage is eerie to say the least. The night before the attack on Umpqua Community College, Laurel stated that Christopher seemed unusually happy and excited about going to school the next morning. The following morning, on October 1, 2015, Harper was on his way to Umpqua Community College. He was decked out in body armor. He brought five handguns and one rifle along with plenty of ammunition for a prolonged gunfight with authorities. At 10.30 a.m., Harper entered his college riding class and opened fire on the students. Eight minutes later, at 10.38 a.m., the first 911 call came in. Somebody is outside one of the doors, shooting through the door. There is a female in the computer lab. We do have one female that has been shot at this time. 
1174, medical aid. This is for an active shooter at UCC. 1174, medical aid. We have a report of one person shot. UCC, 1140, on Road, an active shooter. After this call, two detectives, Joe Caney and Todd Spengath, headed towards the school from five miles away. At 10.41 a.m., Harper had made it into Snyder Hall and continued his rampage. At 10.44 a.m., the two detectives that were en route earlier, Joe Caney and Todd Spengath, arrived on scene alongside a fish and wildlife sergeant, Lynn Withers. The trio were the first ones to arrive. One minute later, at 10.45, Spengath located and began exchanging gunfire with Harper. Between 10.45 and 10.48, Harper leaned out of a classroom and fired at the three authorities on scene. They fired back, successfully hitting Harper in his right side. At 10.48, after being shot, Harper retreated into a nearby classroom and took his own life via gunshot to the head. Afterwards, dispatch asked all ambulances to respond to Umpqua in order to treat victims. Then the bomb squad and authorities cleared out the campus to make sure no other threats were present. Every car parked near the campus was checked for explosives and all was eventually deemed clear. Authorities recovered five pistols and one rifle belonging to Harper as well as additional ammo inside the school. One of the handguns recovered was the one seen in the pawn shop footage, although he never fired it during the attack. Dispatch then confirmed there were nine deceased victims and nine others injured, with some of the injured suffering from multiple gunshot wounds. From the student and faculty perspective, they were sitting in the writing course when Harper entered the classroom and almost immediately started firing. He hit the professor of the class point blank and hit multiple other students with the first barrage of bullets. As he was reloading, he ordered students to stand up if they were Christians. As some of the students stood, he smiled and said, Good, because you're a Christian, you're going to see God in just about one second. Many of those that stood were then shot and killed. At some point early into the attack, Harper ordered students to lay onto their stomachs and not to move. One student, Serena Don Moore, was wheelchair bound but crawled onto the floor anyways. Upon seeing this, Harper told her she could get back into her chair. While getting back into her chair, Harper shot her, ending her life. Harper asked one student to beg for their life and he would spare them. They begged and he shot them anyways. Additionally, he pointed to a male student and ordered him to take an envelope from him and sit in the back of the classroom. He then said, it's your lucky day, you get to live. He then made that student watch as he continued to slaughter his classmates. Meanwhile, students in adjacent classrooms heard what sounded like balloons popping loudly. They turned off the lights and huddled behind desks and backpacks and hid underneath tables. Some students called 911 and others were calling their loved ones in a panic. A student named Chris Mintz in a nearby classroom held the door open for classmates to flee toward the library. Once everyone was out, he followed. Having prior military experience, he took up the role of a leader amongst the chaos and guided students to safety. Once in the library, Chris yelled for other students to flee to the other side of the campus while pushing open every emergency exit and directing others towards the exits. After getting a large majority of students to flee, Chris ran toward the sound of the gunfire. As he ran toward danger, he alerted more students to get away from the campus. He approached a classroom where he peered through the glass and saw a student screaming, covered in blood. Chris yelled to a nearby student that was hiding behind a car to tell the cops to come to his location. Shortly after saying this, Harper leaned out of another classroom and started shooting at Chris. Chris was hit multiple times and fell to the ground. After hitting Chris with a few gunshots, Harper said, that's what you get for calling the cops. Chris responded with, I didn't call the cops, it's my kid's birthday, man. Harper, emotionless and nonchalant, shot Chris in his legs, abdomen, shoulder, and finger. Harper then returned to the classroom he came out of, where he would pop out again to exchange gunfire with authorities. Presumably, this is when Harper got shot and retreated into the classroom for good. It's then said that shortly after retreating back into the classroom, he ended his own life via gunshot to the head. After witnessing Harper shoot himself, the few students left inside of the classroom fled outside toward authorities. Authorities, unaware of what happened inside, raised their guns briefly toward some of the students, but after figuring out that none of them were the perpetrator, they lowered them. They were then given the backpack and the note. 
Authorities have only revealed small blips of what was in the note, with the most chilling statement being, I will be welcomed in hell and embraced by the devil. As he laid outside in immense pain, Chris Mintz saw officers in tactical gear storming the classroom. Students were fleeing, some of them covered in blood. The community and others from all over the world rallied together and raised over $800,000 for the many surgeries and physical therapy sessions Chris would have to endure. Chris would end up surviving and making a recovery, with many people labeling him a hero. He had to learn how to walk again, and the road to recovery was not an easy one. In total, nine students were wounded. Unfortunately, there were many others that did not make it. The teacher that was shot point blank at the beginning of the attack was 67-year-old Lawrence Levine. He was an assistant professor of English, he loved blues music, was a writer of many novels, and loved fly fishing. Serena Moore, age 44, was a strong believer in Christianity and prayer. She was the mother of three sons that she loved very much. Jason Johnson, age 34, was a good student that will be missed by his family. He was proud to be a Christian and although he had recently enrolled in school, was already excelling. Lucas Eibel, age 18, graduated high school with a high GPA and was studying chemistry. He was selected as a UCC scholar, an honor saved for the best of students. He volunteered frequently at the nearby Safari Animal Park and Animal Shelter. He was an amazing soccer player. Kim Dietz, age 59, was a caretaker at a nearby vineyard. She was said to be nice to be around and excelled at the school. She had a daughter at the school as well who was unharmed during the attack. Quinn Cooper, age 18, was from Roseburg and was said to be a funny, sweet, and compassionate person. He loved dancing and voice acting. He was also into martial arts and was about to take his brown belt test a little over a week after the attack. Rebecca Carnes, age 18, was studying at the college with hopes to become a dental assistant. She loved the outdoors and was known to hunt, camp, and ride in the mountains on ATVs. Trevin Onspach, age 20, was said to be a positive young man and his parents called him the perfect son. He was a talented athlete and will be dearly missed by his family. Lucero Alcaraz, age 19, was a UCC scholar and wanted to become a pediatric nurse. They will all be fondly remembered by friends and family. In honor of the victims, the community held a candlelight vigil at nearby Stewart Park. This was a brutal and disturbing case to say the least, but now I want to know your thoughts on this case. We can discuss it in the comments below. That's about all I have for you guys. If you got something from this video or enjoyed it, you know what to do. I'm not going to blabber on. I'm Jeremy the Crime Historian, checking out. Peace. If you're interested in watching more true crime content, I have a playlist with all of my episodes on my channel, or you can check out the video on screen.